Good morning, Crossbridge Church, and happy eighth year anniversary. We are so incredibly excited and honored that the Lord has blessed us with eight amazing years, and we hope that the Lord may bless us with many, many more to come. Church, we want to let you know that we're continuing our current series called The Last Three, which is a series based on Mark's gospel. Before we get into that, we also want to let you know that we have an event coming up for the parents called Parenting in a Tech World, which is being led out by Angel Pardo, which is our kids director. It's happening, it's happening February 5th at 9 through 1 p.m. And if you want more information about that, you can go ahead and check out our app where there will be a lot of future events listed there and many ways to connect with us. Church, that's all for today. So now let us worship together. When night has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost, my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me, yeah, I've decided I'm not good you won't give up on me, you won't give up on me, your love is holding on and it won't let go, I feel it breaking out like an echo, your love is holding on and it won't let go, I feel it breaking out like an echo, echo in my soul. You keep repeating promises to me, yeah. Now there's no stopping what you have started till it is complete. When my mind says I'm not giving up, what you're enough for me, yeah. I've decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me.
The book of Mark chronicles the last three years of Jesus here on earth. They were pretty intense years, to say the least. Since meeting John the Baptist, he was faced with temptations in the desert, performed miracles, healed people, gained followers, was transfigured, and died. A criminal's death. Only to be raised from the dead. What should all this matter for you and I? Join us for The Last Three. The Bible is filled with impossible and hopeless cases, situations that the Word uh, brings, and, and, and we read that people find themselves in situations that have no solutions. And as we've gone through uh, the Gospel of Mark over the last several weeks, we've already read about storms and illnesses and deaths and needs, and yet in every one of these cases, Jesus steps into and provides a solution the only way that He can. Well, today we're in episode five of our current series, The Last Three. It's a series dedicated to talk about and learn from the last three years of Jesus' life and ministry out of the Gospel of Mark. And we find ourselves in another hopeless situation and we'll learn the truth demonstrated yet again that Jesus has the solution. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 5. And let us know where you're watching us from. Go ahead and like and share and comment this uh, service if you're watching us from Facebook or YouTube. And, and, and if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark 5. I'll be reading from verses 21 through 43. This is what God's Word says. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had an issue, a discharge of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, for if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself the power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, don't you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? 
And he looked around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house who said to him, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside, and he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumai which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement, and he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. So Jairus, we just read in the, read in the text, he was a ruler of the synagogue. He wasn't just somebody who attended periodically. This was an influencer. This was somebody who was very well known, and he finds himself at the feet of this rabbi, the feet of this healer, the feet of this, this teacher. He finds himself upended. And for some of us, we find ourselves, or maybe we have found ourselves, in a similar situation that we thought we would never be, because there will be situations in life that will make your position in life irrelevant. Like if there's no peace in the home, there's no position on your job that's going to make you feel good about your life. And so Jairus comes to Jesus. He's desperate about this issue. And he thought that Jesus would be the only person who had the ability to fix it. And I wonder, I wonder if you're not listening today in this season of your life, because everything that you have tried has not only made things worse, but they're no longer relieving the trouble, the pain, the suffering that you find yourself in. And so he's asking Jesus to come with him, to come to his house. And Jesus says, okay, okay, I'll come. You imagine to have a house call from Jesus. That's pretty amazing. And on the way, he gets interrupted. And the thing that he gets interrupted by is what Mark now focuses on in this narrative. And we'll learn several things throughout this story. The first thing we'll learn is the intrusion of Shame. Verse 25 says the woman had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. And can you imagine the pressure that this woman was feeling? It wasn't just physical, it was also emotional. She had this chronic issue of bleeding that would have sapped her strength day after day after day. And apparently she had an issue that was incurable. No doctor can cure it. And so can you imagine the mind job that this must have had on this person? I, I can't have sex with my husband according to Levitical law. I can't have any children. I can't touch anything because I'm considered unclean. No washing dishes, no sweeping floors. I've already spent all my money in trying to figure out what's wrong with me. And to top it all off, I can't even come to church to worship and pray because I'm barred from even coming to the temple. And she could have found a lot of excuses to stay away from Jesus. Like, I don't know, I'm not important enough for Jesus to see me. He's traveling with this Jairus man, so I don't want to bother them. Who am I? I've tried everything else. Why even bother? The neighborhood has already identified me by what, you know, what I suffer from, right? Nobody can see what I'm going through because her condition Right? Her condition, she was bleeding in a place where nobody else can see. It's a lonely feeling. And some of you are hurting right now in places where nobody has any idea about. That's a lonely feeling that nobody can see what depresses you and what dominates you. They only see what you show them. They see the filtered version of you on social media. But they don't know what you're really going through. It's a lonely feeling. And even though you generalize those places and you say things like, yeah, pray for me, pray for my marriage, pray for my kids, pray for my finances, the real issue is you're depressed. You don't feel like a man anymore. You've lost your ability to provide. The real issue is that you're a bitter mom. 
You're a bitter mom because your kids are now all grown up and they're not living up to your ideals anymore. You're not bleeding from your finances. You're not bleeding from your family. You're bleeding on the inside and nobody sees it. The Bible says here Jesus didn't even see here, which begs a lot of questions for me, but that's what the Bible says. He didn't see her, but he felt her presence as she reaches out in faith and touches the, the hem of his clothes because she had heard about Jesus. You know, there was a time where this woman was probably identified by her name, but it's been 12 years. It's been a long time because if people don't know you by your achievements, i.e. Jairus, They'll identify you by your issues. And we do this to ourselves all the time. And it's a dangerous thing. This intrusion creates something pathological, not only for us, but for other people. You'll start believing that you are your anxiety. You are your bipolarism. You are your ADHD. But the truth is, don't ever think that the issue is you. Don't ever think that your only good is your achievements. That you're only good as the trophies or awards or degrees that you got stacked up on some shelf or on some wall. Don't, you, don't, don't believe that because you've been struggling with something so long and so dark that you deserve to be alone and you deserve to be isolated. Stop focusing on and thinking about the wrong things. Verse 28 says here, because she thought, probably in the middle of a thousand other thoughts, because she thought, if I could only touch the hem of his garment, well, then I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'll be healed. And Mark says, just like her bleeding started on the inside, her healing also started on the inside. Notice that Jesus sort of calls her back. He looks around and he, and he calls for her. Again, he, he wants to be more than just a healer to this person. He wants to be her savior. Calls her back to tell her something she already knew. She already knew she'd been healed. But she had never heard from Jesus, heard about him, but never heard from him. Jesus wanted her to hear from him as she becomes the only woman in the entire Bible to be called and to receive this title of daughter from Jesus' lips. If Jesus allowed her to sneak away, she would have been healed. Her bleeding would have stopped. But she would have left believing something about herself that wasn't true. You're not leaving here a thief. You're not leaving here like some beggar. You're not leaving here as the woman with the issue of blood. You are leaving here as a daughter. Shame can do a lot of damage to people. Or as one author and speaker, Brene Brown, says it. She says, shame corrodes the very part of us that believes we are capable of change. I also believe that Jesus calls her back because he wanted Jairus to get all the encouragement that he needed, because he was going to need it. Which leads us to the second thing as we, as we follow along in this story. We see here the invasion of vulnerability. Verse 35 he, uh, tells us that some people from Jairus' house came to tell him that his daughter was dead. Why even bother with the teacher anymore? This must have felt like riding in the back of some ambulance and then getting hit with traffic and then getting hit with gridlock and then hearing the words you feared the most. The teacher doesn't care about your daughter because if he would have, he would have hurried. And I could only imagine what Jairus himself must have been thinking because at first he had to trust for a healing. Now he's got to trust for a resurrection, probably thinking, you know, if it hadn't been for the crowd, we would have probably gotten to my house in time. You know? You know, if it hadn't been for this woman interrupting Jesus, my daughter would be alive and well. You know, Jesus, if you hadn't stopped and interrupted yourself to show so much compassion for this woman, my daughter might be out of bed and walking around. And how many times, how many times in our life has a similar word not come into our hearts? That we, we look back at the times that we have prayed and we wondered why. God, why did you delay and allow this situation to happen? Allow a tragic situation to turn into an impossible situation. But when these things happen in our lives, Jesus has a word for us. He looks at Jairus and he tells him, don't be afraid. Just believe. Don't believe in everything you see. Don't believe in everything you hear. 
Don't believe in everything you know. Trust in me. Listen, your instincts may tell you that the situation is hopeless, but faith looks to a God that's greater than anything you can hear and anything you can see and anything you can know. Everything about the situation may tell you, yeah, it's not going to work. But if you leave it, if you leave your need with Jesus and you trust him with it, he is going to work it out his way. It might not be the way you want him to, but are we content to let God do it his way? I mean, everywhere he went, his disciples was always, they were always telling him to do it another way. Hey, don't talk to someone. Say, hey, don't touch someone. Say, hey, how can you allow this woman? Even here in verse 31, they respond to his question of who touched me? They were like, what do you want us to do? You want us to trace back? We're in a crowd to talk about your feelings or something. Jairus' daughter is going to die. We need to go. Any Look around. Anybody could have touched you. Are, are, are we content to let God do it his way, even if it means people will laugh at us? He gives Jairus a word of faith, a word of hope. He tells your daughter's not dead, she's sleeping. And all of these professional mourners in the house begin to laugh. Do you know it was Jewish custom that if somebody died in your family, you had to hire professional mourners to come and fake cry at your funeral? And if you were poor, if you were broke, you had to hire at minimum two flute players and a female crier. And so the size of this professional mourning committee is determined by economics. So imagine how big the crowd was from the, the ruler of the synagogue. And all of a sudden, these professional criers, they turn into amateur trollers as they all laughed at him, saying, you know, probably saying to Jesus, listen, we know when somebody's dead, like she's not sleeping. We know when somebody is dead, she's dead. She's not alive. You know that unbelief will always laugh at God's word. But faith, faith, man, will always grab a hold of it and experience the power that comes from it. And we need to grab a hold of God's word. And I'm going to tell you why we need to do that. Because life will always throw something at you that'll leave you vulnerable, that'll throw you off. And it don't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how many advantages you have. You'll always be tested in an area where you cannot fix by yourself. And some people would rather die than ask for help because their pride won't allow them to admit that this is just too big for me. And they stop reaching out. Some of you have stopped reaching out because you'd rather be dead than to admit that you need help. You'd rather be dead than to admit, hey, I'm sorry. You'd rather be dead than to admit that you are a fake. You're a fraud. You're a phony. You'll wait. Man, you will wait until this thing kills you. And like this little girl, you can't get up anymore and reach out anymore. Can you imagine what this little girl must have been thinking? As she approaches the end of her life, well, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not supposed to be talking herself out of her future, talking herself out of her dreams, and it's into this situation that Jesus walks into, and the same voice that created this world holds her hand and tells her to arise, and the one that everybody thought was down and out, the one that everybody thought, yeah, her future is over. The one that everybody thought would never be seen again is now looked and she begins to walk. Let me tell you something. To practice resurrection, this resurrection life that we have, it is a deliberate, intentional decision to believe and to participate in resurrection life. Life out of death. Life that trumps death. Life that has the last word. Jesus' life, especially in moments where it seems hopeless, in those vulnerable moments, we need to grab a hold of Jesus' words. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Man, I wish I had a t-shirt that said that. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Or as one Puritan, William Bates, would say, God will try our faith before he satisfies our sight. Here's the last thing we learn, last thing we see here, the interest of the Savior. Faith is born of need. It's only when you recognize your need, 
your need, your sin, your need, that you're able to renounce all confidence that you have in yourself and you turn to Jesus. It's on the basis of seeing that you haven't achieved anything to earn favor with God and you're in great need of a Savior. And God brings this to our attention in a number of ways. Sometimes it's through crisis, sometimes it's through a trial. And, and, and in all of that, what, what, we, what we realize is our inability right, to fix the situation. We, we, we realize our hopelessness and in doing so we turn to Jesus. Two people here, different people, turn to Jesus of their need and they find Jesus fully sufficient to meet those needs because they trust him. What about us? Do we trust Jesus? Do we trust Jesus? Because in order for me to trust a person, I got to know the truth about a person. We've got to know the truth about Jesus. It's not just enough to know the facts about Jesus. It's not just enough to know that he's able to save. Yeah, we know he's able to save, but it's also a conviction of the one who's able to save that he is also willing to save and save us personally to see it in those terms, to see it as a, as a personal thing. Notice in the last verse, Jesus tells him to give this girl something to eat. He's showing his personal concern for not only the greater things, like giving her life, but also the lesser things, like giving her and making sure that she eats a meal, teaching us that there is no need that we have that is so great or so small that's behind our Lord's concern and for which he cannot make provision. He has already obtained for us for those of us who believe in him, for those of us who trust him, for those of us who have faith in him, he's already obtained for us eternal life and resurrection. And if that's true, what won't he be able to provide? Do you believe that the day is coming when we will be complete in him, not just raised from the dead, but raised to glory? Do you believe that? Do you believe that one day we will be what we were originally intended to be? This is something of a foreshadowing that Mark shows us here on what's to come. Because when God deals with us, he deals with us completely. Not partially. Not partially reversing the effects of a thing. No, he deals with us completely. He raised her to complete health. And then he tells everybody, keep this a secret. <laughs> I would have been like, what? What? You realize she's going to be seen alive in the neighborhood. How do you propose we, we keep this on the down low? How, how do we go about that? But here, here's what I think Jesus is driving at. Not to keep this miracle a secret, but to avoid unnecessary publicity. It's not what this girl needed. She, did, she needed to be looked after. She didn't, she didn't need to be made the object of public attention. You don't want the paparazzi coming around here taking pictures. You don't want a long line of people asking a whole bunch of questions. That's not what she needs. What she needs, what the family needed, and what sometimes we need is to be in a place of solitude, to be quiet, a time to reflect on what just happened, a time to reflect and think about what Jesus has just done, to see him and to he see him not just as a healer, he's not just a teacher, he's not just a miracle worker, but to see him as the son of God, the savior of the world. And sometimes we're not given the reason why things happen the way they do. But are we content to let the Savior of the world do it His way? And submitting ourselves to the process because this process still continues even after we become God's people, even after we become His servants. Those of us who have put our faith in Him, uh, our faith in him it's through continuing need that we understand that we have that we experience our need of Him, and as we experience and as we draw closer to Him in a personal relationship of life that not even death can sever, remember, it's a relationship in which we have triumphed in Him over everything. Amen? Would you pray with me? Father, we, we believe. We believe in this season of, of, of fear, and everybody just... It's just pumping fear, fear porn, fear, panic, fear, panic. That's all we read about and see about. Lord, Lord, we repent of our unbelief. Help us in our unbelief, Lord. Let us hold fast to your word. We don't have to be afraid. You are going to provide the great things and the lesser things in our faith journey. Let us believe and trust in who you are 
You're our Savior, and you care for even the minute personal things in our lives. Let, us, let that build confidence in our faith. Let that grow us in our faith. And let us believe in you each and every day more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, friends, thank you for watching. Uh, go ahead and like and subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And remember, you can join me in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. Thank you for watching.